ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to Cold Advent Talk organized by the UHKL, which is like the student body of the KL. My name is Katerina, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is watching. In the past three weeks, we've had the chance to get some insights and views on the whole pandemic by our great guest speakers. And today's guest speaker is Dr. Fabio Mesquita. He's a Brazilian doctor and epidemiologist um, who has worked, example, for example, for the WHO in Asia in the field of HIV and AIDS prevention. And since 2013, he's been working uh, as a head of department in the Brazilian Ministry of Health for HIV and Hepatitis. Um, prevention. So he's, so to say, an expert when it comes to fighting pandemics, and that's why he's here today. And he will talk about the epidemiological background of coronavirus and the current guidelines of the WHO. And before we're getting started, I would like to let you know that um, we have a chat function. So if you have any questions popping up, just let us know, write us a message in the chat, which should be on your right side of the screen. And um, we'll connect those. Don't hesitate to ask away. And we will, or Dr. Fabio Mesquita will answer them at the end of the talk. And with that being said, I would like to introduce you, Dr. Fabio Mesquita. Thank you so, so much for being here. here. Uh, um, I know it's already pretty late in Real Mar, So thank you even more for taking the time. And I would like to hand over the work to you now. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Katerina, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I would like also to thank uh, Team Alice and Fleming uh, that helped in the organization of this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with uh, future colleagues in the medical school, but also future colleagues on the health sector from other schools. Uh, so our talk today will be about the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, giving a global perspective. But um, I, I just want to do a disclaimer from the beginning that uh, besides the fact that I work for WHO for more than 10 years now, I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization, on behalf of but the I'm organization, with my own but I'm speaking with my own personal and, experiences uh, trying to explain and how the organization and myself uh, were involved in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so next slides, please. Next slide, please. Um, we're already on the slide for the organization that um, we work for. Which slide do we want, or like, do you want us to show? Just the next one, please. Okay. So the one with all the decisions of the organization are based on scientific evidence. Oh, there is one before that, I think. There is one before that. The organization that I work for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and there is one other one before that one. Okay. Sorry. The organization that I work for, part one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this, uh, this is basically to describe uh, what WHO is, right? So WHO is a UN, United Nations Agents, that's a, a politic and they specialize in health. So UN has different agencies specialized in different topics, like uh, UNESCO is specialized in education, UNICEF in children and adolescents. So th there are different uh, scopes of work in the UN organizations and uh, WHO works on health. So the organization headquarters is in Geneva, uh, close by to where you are now. And uh, it has six regional offices. Uh, one is the Pan-American Health Organization. The other one is AFRO. Uh, there is another one in Euro. That's the one that uh, works in your area. 
Uh, then we have UNRWA in the Middle East, and then Seattle, where I work in Southeast Asia, and then WIPRO that takes uh, the countries in the Pacific and Asia. So uh, the constitution of WHO uh, was written by a external committee, a technical preparatory committee, in 1946, right after the Second World War. It's under the coordination, uh, it was written under the coordination of a Belgian doctor, René Sand, and was approved in the same year by the International Health Conference held by 51 countries in New York. Um, currently, WHO is composed by 196 countries or 196 member states, we call them. So the constitution, came into force in April 7 of 1948. And until today, uh, you may know that on 7 of April, we celebrate the World Health Day. Okay, the next slide, please. The next slide is already on. Are you? I can't see. You can't see it. I can't see the next one. It's still on the first one. Um, do you mean like um, the organization that I work for part two? Or do you want the yes. slide afterwards? No, the organization that I work for part two. Part but two I can't. Okay. We can see it. Everybody yeah. else can see? Okay, now I can see. So the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of affection or illness. Uh, this is important, moreover, the social aspect of it, because we can see uh, in many communicable diseases like HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and now a lot on COVID-19 that the social aspects are very important. Uh, health for us is a social right inherent to the condition of citizenship, which must be granted without distinction of race, religion, political ideology, or socioeconomic conditions. Health is thus presented as a collective value, an asset for all. I think this is important to have this kind of global, apolitical, uh, uh, intense organization, because like we can see that all the geopolitics of the planet, all the fights between US and China, Russia and US, um, um, like we can see that we need some area of neutral that can work with all these uh, different perspectives and different political uh, and ideological uh, situations. So the next one. Next slide is already on. I don't know if you can see it yet, but- see Now it. I see, yes. Perfect. All the decisions of the organizations are based on scientific evidence. So we can see many interviews of Dr. Tedros, who is our director general, is on the television all the time, on the newspapers, but nothing that he says is his personal opinion. He normally, uh, we have technical working groups of experts from different countries and institutions that work to ensure that the evidence exists and therefore, we can rely on the decisions we announce. We don't say things by what we believe or what we think is interesting, but we only express recommendations based on scientific evidence after a review from external committees. So WHO does not outline guidelines for rich countries. So in case of Europe, USA, uh, Australia, for example, uh, they have their own mechanisms. But we define guidelines for the vast majority of low and middle income countries on Earth, uh, which mean the vast majority of the countries. 
So there are few exceptional, let's say, 20 countries in the world that don't need WHO, but another 178 something needs WHO guidelines and directions. So next, please. It's, it's taking a little bit. It's lacking a little. Yeah, it's lagging. Yeah. No worries. The internet already sees it. As far as I'm concerned, um, it's already live. Maybe it's just you lagging behind me. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit now about the World Health Organization on the COVID crisis and what evidence-based measures we took to control the pandemic. I think this is being a, a important global polemic uh, with some positions like the one from the former president of the United States that lost the election, Donald Trump, that said that uh, uh, the organization was biased and uh, he wants to leave the organization, uh, what is not in the agenda of the new elected president. But uh, this big polemic, this big global polemic, it's important to highlight what did we do during the COVID-19 crisis. So the next slide. So the background to take decisions is what we call the international health regulations. International health regulations was established in 2005 and represents a mandatory international legal agreement involving 196 countries across the globe. And that includes Austria, Germany, and many other countries around you, including all the member states of WHO. So they signed that and committed to these international health regulations. The aim is to help the international community to prevent and respond to acute public health risks that have the potential to cross borders and threaten people worldwide. So if you can associate that with COVID-19, it's a very clear moment to use the international health regulations, right? So the proposal and the scope of the uh, IHR 2005 is to prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to the international spread of any disease in ways that are commensurate with and restricted to public health matters. And if possible, avoid unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade. So WHO is not responsible for the traffic, like air traffic or things like that, or trade, international trade. But our main focus is the public health matters. And when possible, we avoid unnecessary interference, but sometimes it's necessary to stop uh, flights or uh, trade or things like that, as you could see recently, right? So the next slide say that in this uh, regulation, right, in these uh, international health regulations, we have the condition to uh, establish what we call a public health emergence of international concern. So since the regulation was uh, established in 2005, as uh, like how we highlight, how we declare a public health emergency of international concern. So in a condition that an extraordinary event, which is determined to constitute a public health risk to other states through the international spread of disease and to potentially require 
a coordinated international response. This definition implies a situation that is serious, sudden, unusual, or unexpected, carries implications for public health beyond the affected state national border, and may require immediate international action. So this is the only moments when we have that level of situation that we are uh, authorized to declare public health emergence of international concern. So when we use that from 2005 to now, uh, this is basically 15 years. In 15 years, uh, we have declared the public health emergence of international concern five times before COVID-19. So the first one was in April 25, 2009, with H1N1 pandemic that was initiated in Mexico. So in May 5, 2014, uh, by the international dissemination of poliovirus, considered extinct by them. In August 8, 2014, during the outbreak of Ebola in Western Africa. In February 1, 2016, increased cases of microcephaly by Zika virus in Brazil. And in May 18, 2018, Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And now, in January 30 of 2020, COVID-19 crisis initiated in Wuhan in China. So what I want to highlight here is that this decision to call this a public health emergence was taken very early. So the first cases appear in December. In the end of January, we took that position uh, to announce that this was a public health emergence of international concern. And it's curious here because uh, like on the geopolitics, all the politics about COVID-19 worldwide, there was a lot of blame to China for this specific condition. But we never heard any blame to Mexico or to Brazil or to Western Africa in other crises uh, with similar risk, uh, at least with similar threatening. Uh, of course, COVID-19, as we could see, is the most serious thing we have in the last 100 years. But again, uh, so the geopolitics cannot confound uh, the decisions that may need to be based on science and evidence. So in the next slide, we will see when WHO declared pandemic. Although the WHO member states have signed this threat, and this is very important, the organization limits of action are diverse because each country has the autonomy to apply or not apply its, in its own territory, which the organization recommends that should be done. In addition, since its signature, the text is explicit that should avoid as much as possible interfering with air traffic and commerce. And I think this phrase is very important uh, before the declaration of pandemic, basically to say that the countries have autonomy to take their own decisions. WHO can give overall recommendations, suggestions, but some countries, for instance, decided just to do not follow these recommendations. And this is very obvious worldwide. We can mention countries here, but it's uh, almost unnecessary to understand that some countries didn't follow the recommendations and therefore their uh, impact on the pandemic was higher. So we still, the WHO Health Security Council recommended that the Director General 
uh, uh, write a decree uh, for COVID-19 as a pandemic in March 11 of 2020. So that was when China was still the epicenter of the epidemic and Europe and the Americas did not have the epidemiological picture that followed. So it's important therefore to highlight that in January 30, it was declared a public health emergence of international concern. And in March 11, it was declared a pandemic. So it was very clear that this was very, very serious and everybody needs to take care and attention. So outside of China on the day of March 11, when it was declared pandemic by WHO, there were a total of 37, 364 cases and a total of 1,130 deaths in the whole world, with 113 countries and territories reporting cases. Nowadays, only two countries have not reported cases in the whole planet. So in the next slide, we're gonna see that some island in the Pacific, some islands in the Pacific area, they did not declare cases until now. And let's say that uh, if you want to spend uh, the summer somewhere, uh, of course, uh, under the time of the summer of these countries, which is exactly uh, right now, starting December. So safest place to go now and to live so far are Kiribati, Micronesia, Nauru, Palau, Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, uh, all in the Pacific Islands, are seven Pacific Islands. But the number of inhabitants of these places are very small, as you can see, and the connections in terms of globalization, number of flights, like Nauru, for instance, has one flight per week, like, and therefore the pandemic didn't achieve them yet. And there are two countries that never declare a case. What doesn't mean they don't have cases. And like, if you prefer, there is the option of North Korea or Turkmenistan that never declare any case of COVID-19. Um, but I don't think this is serious. So what about next slide for the historical evolution of Corona? Right? So coronavirus was something that we knew before. That's, this is not the first coronavirus in history, and we were very used to. Uh, was a cause of common cold in health adults. Uh, so meaning globally, about 10 to 30% have had some contact with four strains of coronavirus. So these four as, uh, were very known far before any complicated coronavirus came out. So in the next slide, you can see that in 2002, that means 18 years ago, almost 20 years ago, appears the first serious coronavirus. And that was the one that caused the SARS outbreak that was more related to uh, the region I work in Southeast Asia. And uh, so in this SARS outbreak, uh, patients would present fever, cough, and dyspnea, and 20 to 30% required mechanical ventilation. And the dead rate was about 10% was a very high dead rate by the time. Fortunately, by the time, uh, we didn't have the globalization so clear like today. We didn't have too many flights all over the planet. We didn't have too many connections uh, um, uh, uh, around the whole planet. So uh, SARS got uh, limited to one region of the planet. 
So the next one, the next slide, we can see in the historical evolution of Corona in 2012, 10 years after SARS, we, had, we have had MERS outbreak. And this was the second coronavirus that was very violent and was very impressive. And again, it was contained in one region of the planet in the Middle East, and uh, though the patients by the time presented with severe atypical pneumonia, gastrointestinal symptoms, and AKI, 50 to 89% required mechanic ventilation, and 36% died. Well, that was really more serious than SARS, and really more important. Again, uh, we were lucky that it was restricted to one specific area of the planet. And this specific area of the planet was the Middle East by the time. And then 2020, uh, when we discovered the novel coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, China, and presented with severe atypical pneumonia, mostly. Not only. Okay, in the next slide. So what did we learn it from COVID-19 in these 12 months, right? So basically overall, and this is very generic because it may vary from country to country, but taking the global picture, 15% will need hospitalization of the people who got the virus. And the majority of them will need mechanical ventilation. 5% of this 15% will need ICUs. And lethality rate is around to 1% to 2%. And it's becoming better over time uh, as much as we learn on how to confront the disease. So in comparison to SARS and in comparison to MERS, this was, uh, let's say, not so harmful in comparison to the other two coronavirus uh, in terms of lethality rate. However, the spread and the globalization was incredible, was really all over the planet. So in the next slide, we can see what we learned in terms of how to, how to manage the clinical cases. I think Katerina mentioned that my main experience professional for many years, I worked since 1987 with HIV, and I worked since the year 2000 uh, with viral hepatitis. Uh, so I worked with virus for many years. And normally, in our mindset, as medical doctors working in epidemics, working with virus, we thought in the beginning that if we have a good and effective antiviral or antiretroviral uh, that can avoid the multiplication of this virus, so we're going to be safe. And so we try it first just to confront the virus. But then we learned that there is another phase that is very different from every other virus, which is a phase of uh, that people start to have problems in the pulmonary uh, area, and basically it's a microcoagulation. So basically the, as a reaction of the body with the virus um, multiplication, your, um, uh, your body reacts with a pulmonary uh, microcoagulation. And then there is a third phase that's more severe, that is uh, a very, very strong uh, inflammatory reaction. And this inflammatory reaction is uh, the main cause of deaths of uh, COVID-19. So we learned during the time that an antiviral or antiretroviral is not enough to solve the problem. 
they may be very useful in the first phase of the problem, like we can see here, three phases. Uh, in the second phase, we really need the anticoagulants because coagulation is the main problem. And in the third phase, we need uh, corticoids. Uh, and basically, dexamethasone is being used in this more severe uh, phase of the disease. It's curious because it's not common for us as medical doctors to consider the use of corticoids in a viral infection. And in the beginning, uh, we didn't use too much corticoids because we thought this would suppress the immunosystem and facilitate the multiplication of the virus. But then we learned after some studies uh, conducted most in UK that uh, this is the main cause of that is exactly this very severe inflammatory response and dexamethasone is the solution uh, uh, and help it to save a lot of lives. So in the next slide, uh, we can see that because this was completely new um, and we haven't had a similar problem before, we, we have had coronavirus before, as we could see, but not like this one. We haven't had the globalization in the planet as we had in 2020. And therefore, uh, everything was challenged and new. So the WHO recommendations was basically from the beginning, if you don't have a medicine that can cure the problem, and if you don't have a vaccine that can prevent the problem, the recommendation should be a public health recommendation. What do you need to do to avoid the spread of the virus? And this is public health, basically. But this is not opinion or personal uh, belief. This is based on evidence. And uh, how do we got this evidence? So the WHO recommendations came as soon as a multilateral mission of scientists from many different countries in the world, recruited by WHO, came and visited China in February of 2020 and observed for 15 days what could be done in terms of containment measures until it was possible to develop one effective vaccine or medicine. With this, the recommendations were and continue to be. And just to recall that China controlled the spread of the pandemic, and uh, therefore there was a lot to learn from them. Of course, because of the system um, that is a different political system, some of the measures and some of the culture of China is probably impossible to apply all over the planet, but at least the recommendations, the technical recommendations, we really need to push for uh, to try to control the pandemic with public health uh, interventions. So the first one was test, test, and test. So why we need to test people? Because we need to learn who is positive. We need to do active church, uh, search. We need to track. We need to do isolation of everyone who is positive. Without testing, we cannot uh, track. We cannot isolate. We cannot do active search. So test, test, and test is the first one for sure. So where it's not possible to test in a sufficient, uh, sufficient quantity, ensure quarantine, social isolation, and the use of masks that came late as recommendation. The use of masks came as recommendation in April. And why was that? Because before April, we had no idea how we could have enough masks for all the health professionals that need and the population at large. The industry of masks was very focused on health professionals. The quantity available was really limited and there was not enough masks to everyone in the planet. So one of the problems we have with this pandemic is the size of the problem. 
and everything we need is big in terms of quantity. And we were not prepared before, so we need to adapt to the challenge. So that's why the recommendation for masks came late. But uh, ensure quarantine, social isolation, social distance, right? Uh, as well, and the use of mask is extremely important. So always wash your hands. Alcohol gel is a plan B if you cannot wash. Social etiquette with coughing and sneezing. Hygiene of places where many people circulate. So then the last one is the use of personal protective equipment for health professionals. Varying specifications depending on the service provided. Of course, a community health worker needs some kind of PPE and the ICU professional who is taking care of uh, very severe cases needs a different PPE, but uh, personal protective equipments are crucial for all health professionals because we are leading with people, we are in contact with people, and uh, uh, these people comes to us because they are sick, and uh, so we need to be protected. If we lose the health professionals, nobody else can help to control the problem. And as we all know, we lost a lot of health professionals do during this pandemic. So in the next slide, we'll see the picture of a few hours ago. This was uh, 6.58 PM for me. It's about two hours ago, less than two hours ago, an hour and something. So this is the picture of COVID-19 today, uh, 7.6 million. 934,266 cases reported and 1,695,307 deaths occurred by COVID-19. So in terms of cases, uh, US uh, is the epicenter, India is the second one, and Brazil is the third one followed by Russia, French, UK, and so on. And in the case of deaths, we have US as the first one, Brazil, the second one, India, the third one, Mexico, the fourth one, and so on. So this is in the John Hopkins uh, University um, the Coronavirus Research Center, and is one of the most uh, updated and uh, trusted information that we, we can go online and take at any moment. So in the next slide, we can see the cases in Europe. This is a data from today again. It's a very recent data. Uh, those are the cases in Europe, in Europe proportional to 100,000 inhabitants. And of course, with the small countries, the proportion is higher. And we have countries um, like uh, Luxembourg, Montenegro, um, I think it's uh, Chen uh, a Czech, uh, then uh, Belgium, Armenia, Georgia, Slovenia, Switzerland, in that order are the number of cases proportional to the population. So Austria here is number three, six, nine, 12. It's number 12 proportional to the population. Um, just to call the attention, Austria is higher than France and France is in the uh, media all the time. Uh, but it's something to pay attention uh, in epidemiology is not only the number, but the number proportional to the population. So in the next slide, we see the same picture, but this is more global, about the deaths for 100,000 inhabitants. And then we see that uh, the worst scenario, globally speaking, proportional to the population was in Italy, followed by Spain, then UK, 
United States, Argentina, Mexico, France, Brazil, and so on. So this is, again, is not only the number of deaths, but the number of deaths proportional to the population that is really uh, important to measure in terms of epidemiology. So all the sources come from the same uh, John Hopkins, and uh, so it's easy to find out on the internet. So next one. So WHO described a new phenomenon that occurred during the COVID-19 uh, crisis that uh, it was nominated by infodemic. Infodemic is a new concept described by WHO as a epidemic of information or a information epidemic. There is a lot of information. Some of them are correct, but most of them are incorrect. And some of them are, uh, are also known as fake news. And this is really hard for the public health service to control a pandemic like that because of the level of misinformation that people is receiving. The most important thing for us that are health professionals are interested in understand exactly what's going on is to know if the source of the information is reliable. You certainly can find the information in the Ministry of Health of your country, depending on the country, not everywhere the information is stressful, but I would suggest four sites that are based on evidence to compile information. The one for WHO, the one for John Hopkins University, the one for the European CDC, and the one for the US CDC. So these four uh, sources of information are completely reliable. So the next one is, I'm coming to the end of my uh, exposition, but it's basically to talk a little bit about vaccines. Vaccines as every infectious disease is the light in the tunnel in terms of solution, right? Is the real solution of the problem. Of course, we can take many measures in terms of public health to prevent. Uh, we can treat people that are sick, but if we wanted to control something really to get to a point that we can stop the spread of this disease, vaccines are really the light on the tunnel. So on the next slide, we can see the vaccine platforms. Uh, so we can see that uh, we have many ways of producing vaccine. And what is quite interesting in terms of this uh, COVID-19, is that there are new technologies, uh, like the last two, that are basically genetic vaccines. Those are completely new and only possible during this last year on the production of COVID-19 vaccines. So the previous ones, we have experiences. There are vaccines for COVID-19 also using the previous uh, platforms or the previous methods, but, uh, but they were used in other infectious disease. And uh, so you can see here, like uh, for polio, uh, for uh, varicella or TB, for pertussis, HPV, hepatitis B, Ebola, other veterinary vaccines. So we have a lot of experience worldwide in vaccines. So why a vaccine was produced in so short period of time? And this is very important because some people do not trust very much in that information, but basically what we have that made a difference was money. Basically, we have a mobilization of resources from all over the planet to make sure that we could make it. And we have a great science experience and competency from other vaccines 
and we have a lot of uh, new uh, technologies in terms of uh, genetics that we can really use and we are using on these new vaccines that are coming also to COVID-19. So what are the vaccines that are available at this point? So we have these new technologies, genetic vaccines, uh, two that are already uh, approved for use, at least for the uh, US FDA and some other international agencies, which is the one from Pfizer and the one from Moderna. They have different technologies, but both of them are uh, vaccines using genetics. So the leave virus vectors, uh, so basically taking a, a very, let's say, sweet virus and using them as vectors uh, are the one from Oxford, AstraZeneca, the one from Sputnik, the Russian vaccine, and the CanSino Biologics. Uh, so all of them are using um, uh, virus like adenovirus and putting a piece of the coronavirus on it, uh, and, and therefore they do leave virus vectors. And uh, there is a technique of inactivated viruses that we have from Wuhan and Sinopharm vaccines and Sinovac, all of them produced in China. Uh, all of those vaccines are starting to be used like in China, in Russia, uh, in UK, in US, uh, and in many other countries worldwide, uh, they are starting to vaccinate as you all are aware of. So what WHO did on that? So our main concern that we saw for the masks, we saw for the ventilators, we saw for many other um, uh, challenges, tools that we need to have to face the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we saw that the rich countries, they paid for and got almost everything for them. So our role is to try to do what we call uh, uh, the minimum a, uh, capacity for the developing world, for low and medium income countries, do equity. So that's our tentative of doing equity. And therefore, we created this initiative that's called COVAX. And this initiative comes out with many uh, important foundations, private sector, and uh, big uh, international organizations that joined together and we committed to deliver 2 billion doses of vaccines for low and medium income countries by the end of 2021. This, uh, like if we consider that we have 7 billion, 800,000, 800 million inhabitants in the world, um, this seems to be not too much. But if we consider that Europe will take care of themselves, uh, North America will take care of themselves. Like my country, Brazil, is already producing vaccine. India is producing vaccine. China is producing vaccine. Um, Russia is producing vaccine. So this will help every other small country, medium country, uh, that don't have a, a, a great economy and uh, will be a lot of vaccines to support them. So this initiative was basically my last slide, right? Is uh, those organizations, Gavi is a very, very uh, famous um, organization that's a multila multilateral organization that works on vaccines for years now, and they, they do all vaccines. So of course the UN organizations some of the multilateral banks, developing banks, like the um, World Bank and some other big uh, agencies, and CEPI, that's a Norwegian association, that's the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. They all joined together for uh, this initiative of WHO, 
that was the COVAX uh, initiative. I think that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I will be uh, very happy to answer uh, if there is any question. Thank you, over. Thank you so much for taking the time for this talk. There indeed appeared some questions. And the first one is, um, we heard the news, there is potentially a new mutation of the virus spreading or it was identified. Um, do you have any sort of experience with viruses changing? What could happen in the future? Could the vaccination strengthen us against it? Or would it be like a flu-like disease? Do you have any experience with this? Yes, we do have a lot of experience. So my, my whole professional life was to work with virus and virus always trying to mutate. It's completely expected. There was no surprise. There are cases in the south of UK that appears to be uh, with some mutations, uh, but it's not characterized yet as a new type of virus. Just uh, uh, to... Um, uh, do as an example for HIV, we have HIV 1 and 2, um, or for hepatitis that we have hepatitis A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so this is not another virus, it's just a virus with some mutations as expected. And uh, from the perspective of vaccines or treatment, uh, at this point it didn't change anything. I hope this helps to answer the question. But you do see some parallel, parallels when talking about HIV or hepatitis, you see parallels with the viruses. Sure, uh, uh, there are many parallels, uh, but also there are many differences. And uh, uh, I would say like uh, for HIV, uh, from the beginning, I think the global commotion was kind of similar. Uh, moreover, because it was a virus that could uh, get people from every social class, um, could get people very famous, like uh, basketball players or singers or uh, important, uh, 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 let's say, uh, rock stars. Uh, so, uh, of course, th that called the attention of everybody from the beginning for HIV, but with a past time, like we are 40 years of uh, the first case of HIV now, uh, after 40 years, HIV became more focused uh, on the, uh, the sub-Saharan Africa that has the majority of the cases or everywhere else in key populations mostly. And because these key populations are uh, people who use drugs, commercial sex workers, uh, trans people, uh, gay and men who have sex with men, and uh, uh, prisoners. So uh, the attention to HIV uh, over time was not as relevant was, uh, as it was in the beginning. And therefore, in terms of investments or uh, the money allocated to it, um, for uh, everything else uh, was not that simple. But anyhow, HIV today is a chronic manageable disease. Uh, we can see some data in places like Vancouver in Canada, where people living with HIV lives more, uh, the life expectation is higher than the general population, basically because they go to the doctor every month and everything that they have as side effects or problems, they are taken care of. And people don't like to go to doctors, as we all know. Um, but people with HIV needs to go to doctor every month. So the medicines, when I started to work with HIV, there was no medicines. Then we have the monotherapy with AZT. In 1996, uh, we have the cocktail or the triple therapy by the time my patients would take 12, 16 pills per day, and today they take one pill per day, almost no side effects, and um, um, really uh, uh, the life expectancy and the normal life became 
um, a, a chronic manageable disease. Uh, so for uh, flu, I think it's probably the most uh, similar to COVID-19. We may need in the near future to have an update of the vaccine every year or every two years. This is, of course, is history to be developed. Um, I'm a little bit in the future. I'm four and a half hours ahead of you. So, but uh, we need a lot of future uh, to understand how the vaccine will work. And we may need to update the vaccine like we do for flu every year. So for flu, we change the vaccine every year exactly to update what is expected with this mutation on virus. Um, I think those are the similarities that I can see. And, uh, uh, and like uh, at this point, because of the impact, the social impact, the economic impact, the uh, health sector impact of COVID-19, uh, this is the main threat we had uh, in the last 100 years. And, uh, and therefore, um, uh, the investment to find a solution is really impressive. And uh, I'm very optimistic about uh, this uh, near future. I think we have had, all of us, a very hard 2020. It was not easy, but um, I think this will be in our mindset in history at some point to say, oh, 2020 was a very hard year, but uh, in 2021, we learned how to overcome that. Thank you very much. I have another question because you talked about the spreading earlier on. So there were different um, types of coronavirus, as you told us, emerging in the past. Why is the third type of virus now spreading more easily? Do you know what I mean? Why was it in the past, why was it only located in one part of the world and why is it now everywhere? Um. Actually, like if we, if we see the subtypes of the virus, wherever we can measure that, the problem is the technique and the technical capacity to do that. Um, there are many small mutations in the virus over the 12 months. So this one became very popular became, uh, because came to the media, and uh, came to BBC News was uh, like became something, uh, 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 let's say, spread as information. But uh, minor changes in the virus we have seen all the year. Uh, and again, I'll just repeat that it's completely expected in any virus, right? Because the virus to multiply, he needs to interact to your cells, right? To our cells. So he interact with human cells, and uh, therefore, depending where it is, uh, what region of the planet, what region, uh, all, all the circumstances, some mutations are completely expected. So this one became really famous, but was not the first one, not the only one. Uh, but again, we are not concerned yet uh, because it was not a big, uh, mutation that changed everything. Like, let's say, the vaccines that are being tested will be completely ineffective for this new virus. There's no new virus, it's just uh, changes uh, that are expected. Perfect, thank you. And the last question is about MERS-2. We read reports that it's re-emerging. Do you know anything about this? Do you have any information about this? Sorry, I, I didn't understand exactly the question. We had reports that. Um, MERS 2 is uh -huh. researching, like there are some new cases. Do you have any information about this? No, sorry, I don't have this information. Uh, but MERS 2 uh, is considered completely under control. Uh, was a very important um, uh, problem from 2012 to 2014, was almost two years. Um, uh, uh, there were a few cases after that, but uh, it's considered completely under control. So I didn't hear anything new about it. Perfect. 
Thank you very much. I think this was the last question. Um, thank you so much for taking the time, even though it's really late um, in Myanmar right now. Um, thank you so much for being here and telling us, telling us about this interesting topic. And I think from my side, from the whole team, everyone behind the cameras, um, thank you so much for being here. And it was a great, great pleasure to be with you and uh, uh, my future colleagues. Uh, we all will need you a lot, not for only for this, but for everything else that we have as challenge in the health sector. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your kind words. And for everyone who's watching behind the camera, I've got a small announcement to make. So there's another talk coming up today or tonight at 6 p.m. Dr. Scheibenbogen will reflect or um, discuss the question whether the COVID crisis is also a psychoso psychosocial pandemic. And tomorrow there will be the last talk in our COF Advent talk line. So tomorrow, Tuesday, Tuesday the 22nd December at 5 p.m., Dr. Buchal will discuss the emotional stress because of the corona lockdown situation with us. So if you're interested, please tune in. Um, besides that, I think nothing else left to say. Have a very nice afternoon. And thank you very much for sticking with us. Thank you.